Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Justin Gunther. I'm the director here at Falling Water, and we're honored to have Rick Dark join us today for this month's webinar. Um, and thank you all for joining from wherever you're signing in from. Um, and you know, Rick's uh, connection with Falling Water is probably what Rick thirty some years yeah, it's, of a connection. It's, it's thirty some years. I, this this is only going to be uh, digital photography today, which is about a quarter century. <laughs> but I started, started back in film. If anybody here is old enough to remember what film was. Film and color slides, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, and that connection with Falling Water started with uh, Linda Wagoner, who was the previous director here at Falling Water and has continued on um, with me now in that seat. So we're yeah. honored to have Rick's uh, studying and observing um, the, the environment here at Falling Water for, for decades. Um, and and as, as all of you know, there's, there's such an intimate tie between the natural world and architecture here at Falling Water. It's that unified composition of art and nature. And, and what that does and what you're going to see today through Rick's photography is the fact that Falling Water has a whole nother temporal dimension. Um, and it's that dimension uh, that allows every experience of this place to be different from visit to visit. So subtle changes in light and dark. It's subtle changes in weather from sun to rain to snow like we have here today. Um, it's the different ways the house reacts to the changes in the seasons. Um, so you're gonna see those wonderful, the way that the uh, environment here is constantly evolving and reacting to its landscape um, through, through Rick's um, power of observation. And you're gonna give us some tips too, Rick, about how we can pay more attention to the places that we care about uh, in the landscapes that are around us. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, so you, you've got my video on right now and I, I wanted to leave it on just so that everybody knows I really am a live human being on the other side, but I'm gonna turn <laughs> my video off when I start the content. Justin, I'm gonna start the screen. All right, I'm gonna turn my video off too so that okay. I'm not interfering with your imagery. So here is, so you are, Justin, are you now seeing my right screen? You've got we are, screen. yeah, we're seeing your, you're moving around your contact sheet. So for those of you that are out there, I can't ask for a show of hands, I wish I could, but uh, I am a uh, Apple computer user, a Mac user, so I'm actually gonna be using their keynote program today, not PowerPoint. Uh, and um, uh, I'm gonna turn my video off now. It's a little bit sturdier, uh, especially in this environment. It's especially better for higher res images. And I have a lot of very brief, but high res videos inserted in this program. Uh, the better your connection, the smoother they'll run. Uh, Justin and I both have good connections here. Uh, I'm on a Fios line and they'll run just like they do on my computer. Um, but I think in any case, you'll see they're not used gratuitously, but they are there to try to add a little bit of dimension that you can't see with stills. So if I bring up that first image, I don't know how many of you have been to Falling Water. Um, I would hope many of you have, I've hoped many of you have multiple times, but one of the greatest joys in my association with Falling Water and its people and the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy is just getting to know it as a really good friend over literal decades. And it's an intimacy that develops just like in any relationship. And each time it gets deeper and it gets more satisfying. So just beginning that image with an abstract of the falls just below the house, it was taken this fall. This is the only image you're gonna to see today that is not taken by me at Falling Water. Uh, this is where we are, I'm speaking to you now about five hours east of Falling Water. I'm still in Pennsylvania, but we are right near the, the, the extreme southeastern tip of PA. So my wife, Melinda, who works at the University of Delaware Botanic Garden. We both have ecology backgrounds that have horticulture layered on top of them. Um, we're both very much involved with conservation. Uh, I like to say that when Melinda leaves the house in Pennsylvania to, to go to her position at the University of Delaware Botanic Garden, she has to drive entirely across the state of Maryland uh, through Delaware to get to the job. And it's a six mile ride. We are in this tri-state area, but we're lucky because we have similar mechanisms to what those of you are in Western Pennsylvania have with the Conservancy, we have 9,000 acres of walkable open space that are accessible to us from the house. 
and that's the White Clay Creek Preserve. This is the White Clay Creek you're looking at. This is an image I used in a book that Doug Tallamy and I did. It was taken actually not with a drone, but out the, the back door of a helicopter. The door was off and uh, we were flying over the, the creek about a half mile from the house. That little dot in the center there, if I move my cursor around, is a blue heron flying 50 feet over the water and about 250 feet below my craft. It's the reason that we're here and we are very much dedicated to saving these kind of places, which is why both Falling Water and the Conservancy mean so much to us. Linda and I have both been on the board of our local land trust. My brother, Jerry, is now the president of the local land trust. Um, we're people who like to give time to bettering the community and um, that the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy has been a huge force for that in Western Pennsylvania. Now, I am gonna be talking about landscape today. I'm gonna to show you a bit of architecture, but the delight for us over these years of going out to Falling Water certainly has been this incredible destination. But the journey, once you get off the Pennsylvania Turnpike or Route 68 or 70 or whatever you take, when you get on these back roads and Laurel Highlands and all, it's just gorgeous. It's gorgeous in every, every season, every kind of weather, and uh, I know that when we travel out there, the, the sense of anticipation builds. This is one of the curves just a mile or so uh, south of Falling Water on 381. And um, I'm gonna mix the photography with, these are all shots I took. They're all taken with digital cameras and some of them more recently with phones, but they're all taken pretty much unadulterated as they came off the device I took them with capturing different times. And so Laurel Highlands with its uh, an evening and the clouds coming in, maybe there's a weather system there, but different kind of beauty. Over the years, uh, partly it's, it's the kind of work that I do. I you know, work with ecological process, if you will. I work with, I grew up in, a, uh, in this Eastern region in Northeastern region of, the, of North America. And so I'm a deciduous forest kind of person. I did a book on woodland gardens years ago, and that was about looking. And part of what you get when you look and look and look and compare, and especially using the camera as an aid, is that I can look at this scene, which is heading south from falling water into Ohio pile. I can look at it in this fall image, but I could with my mind's eye actually take it apart and say, what does it look like in winter? Exact same scene taken with different cameras, different seasons, but capturing, if I go back and you look at that, understand what it is that makes that scene and how it changes different, different seasons. Of course, there are not black lines of trees at the edges of those hills. It's just the way the light compresses that many trees uh, in density and they look like they're darker. I, uh, the Hickman Chapel, uh, it, the delightful part of this story is that this was donated to the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy in 2017. It's now been restored. Uh, it was a chapel, um, a Baptist chapel built in 1901, an, a very important part of the community that really had its congregation diminished by the 80s, but enough people cared about it that they put it in good hands and it's there. Well, these are shots that I've taken over the years just because it was another one of those things that said, you know, we're getting close to falling water. And this is another bit of people and place in Western Pennsylvania. Different light, look at the color of the sky. You know, here, here is a day where it's bright and there's brightness on the, on the uh, chapel. And here's a day where you've got some kind of a storm system coming in, but there's still sun in the foreground. This is the kind of stuff that if you really care about landscapes, you look at, there's, there's an iPhone photograph. And sometimes quick and dirty, an iPhone can do a really good job. I use a modern uh, 11 Pro, so it's got three sensors and three lenses on it. And it really does some very fine work, but this is just stopping momentarily, getting out of the car, stopping and taking a picture and dim light and a lot of cloud cover, but a beautiful little building. That's when the windows were out for restoration. It's now restored. We travel around the area. We use falling water as a base. Uh, and this is confluence. If anybody wants to email me and tell me what they were doing with these buildings, I have no clue. I've never found anybody who could explain it to me. I did stop somebody on the street one time, but I love this kind of stuff. It's vernacular architecture. 
it continues to morph and change. Two buildings become one. Who knows? Confluence PA. A number of years ago, Justin, I can't remember how many, but it's quite a while. Um, uh, Justin and Anne uh, were at a uh, conference that I was speaking at. It might have been the Miller, Millersville conference. And they came up later and said hello and said, you know, we, we'd like to have some help working with landscapes at Falling Water that don't really, the work doesn't really fit into traditional landscape architecture. We'd love to have you help us. And, you know, as part of what we might be able to offer you as compensation is we have this little cabin that used to be a post office. It's in the middle of the Bear Run Preserve in the woods in a meadow clearing. And you can come and have that cabin and use that as your base of operations. And it's within walking distance of the house. Sometimes I'm taking cameras, I just drive across the road, but it's been a marvelous way to be in that landscape. It is just a meadow clearing and these are just, these are just uh, it's uh, New York ironweed and uh, the tall Joe pie weed, spotted Joe pie weed growing out in a meadow. There are different seasons, this is another year with uh, gold, golden rods in there. But to have that, that base where we could be in a, a cabin that speaks of the era, speaks of the, the, the area, it speaks of uh, a clearing in the woods and of a lot of this regenerative growth uh, that marks Western Pennsylvania. These are plants that I know from traveling around the area are very often likely to come in if there is a clearing in the woods. Sometimes it's enough to just be there. I might've been out taking photographs or we might just be on the porch. And this is a photograph taken from one of the wooden bent wood chairs on the back porch, just looking at all these different swallowtails out there on those same plants with the wind kind of rustling in the background. There are other times when it's enough to just say, all right, we've got work to do, we've got thinking to do, we've got reading to do, we're talking, and we're just happy to just be there and let it rain. Because it's all a part of the, not just the temporal uh, dimensions of falling water, but the oral dimensions, the sounds, the scents, all the different things that make that place so special. I, um, Talk to uh, Ann Talarek, uh, the, the uh, head of horticulture for Falling Water, again, who I've known uh, with Justin for decades. And I was talking to her about this fall, it was, in, it was in October, about maybe making a trip west. And she said, oh, I think this is maybe the best fall that I've ever seen. And you know, she's from Pittsburgh, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna take her word for it. So she said, give, give Justin a call. And of course the house has been closed for a year because of the coronavirus, but the, um, the, the cabin hadn't been open, but Justin said, yeah, if you wanna come out and take some pictures, uh, we can open that cabin for you. So I felt safe going into the cabin. I had, in the beginning of the year, bought a, a very good uh, Sony A, A7 IV uh, full range, um, full size sensor camera system that I thought it would be wonderful to turn those cameras on this landscape. So here I am arriving in fall and just driving down that road into falling water. And part of what I've loved about it, we sort of, we did this at Longwood Garden for our career for 20 years. We tried to make the experience begin as you enter, because most people are coming in by car. And so the idea that that whole journey into the landscape and architecture begins at the entry point was important. This is uh, Paul Mayan's work. He was a Spanish uh, architect very close to uh, Edgar Kaufman Jr. And he was the one who was given the opportunity to do this visitor center. And I just still, I think it's fantastic. It is many decades old. It could have been done yesterday. It's a glorious building that doesn't, to me in any way compete with falling water, but like falling water, it opens you into the landscape. It opens you into relationships and colors and light. And it's been my, probably my top example of how you might, when you've got an iconic place, how you might introduce people to it without upstaging it or demeaning it in any way. And Paul Mann's Visitor Center certainly does that. It's just a marvelous building. It's so simple. It, it, it doesn't say expensive, it just says highly functional. This is a building for welcoming you and for seeing. It has these open spaces open to the sky. As someone tuned to, to landscape, what I've loved about it is that the vegetation is not 
it's not all trimmed or proper. It's, it is just the vegetation of Western Pennsylvania as you would see it regenerating in this area. And it's integrated into the, the building spaces. You can be there and this photograph is taken at the time when the uh, witch hazels are blooming. It's just marvelous, right in the middle of it. You can get a good meal there. You can sit there, you can read there, you can use the shop, you can buy a book, but you can really get a beginning of what is this place like? What is that landscape like? The, um, the other thing that struck me the first time I saw it, and it has never ceased to have that power of the first visit is when you take the walk down this marvelous boardwalk that's meted to the stones on the way down to see the house, it is a slow unfolding. And it's just so graceful as you go down, eventually the, the wood turns to a, a asphalt and the stones are the edging on it. And it, it gradually takes you down to you get to this point. And so it's not like you turn a corner and there is the house smack in your face. It's you turn a corner and you're looking through the landscape. You're looking, in this case, this is an early spring photograph. You're looking through the fenestration of the forest, the forest, forest windows, it's framing, and the house just becomes resolvable. And if you don't know it, it's marvelous to say, what is it? It's a form. It's got layering to it like the woods does. And it becomes obvious as you get closer and as you read it through the trees. And I know that uh, it, here's another season. If you, if you do that same walk later when the leaves are there, you're gonna have to get closer to the house before it opens up. But it's just marvelous when it, when it does open up and you see it sitting there. Uh, in this case, I'm taking a view partly up the hill again. And if I, if I go further up to the hill at a vantage point that uh, Ann showed me a couple of years ago, they've kind of just did very subtle trimming to make it evident. That's the kind of really quiet work that they do. It's, it's landscape gardening, it's design. But if you didn't know, you'd say, oh, it's just nature. It's just a natural, nobody did anything here. And that is the beauty of it. That is the real artistry of it is making it an experience that just absolutely seems intuitive and unscripted. Because I am a student of woodland landscapes and ecologies, I know that the Eastern deciduous forest is full of layers. It's got its verticals and it's got its horizontals. And tell me what better expresses verticality and horizontality than the woods or this house. It's just remarkable. And I know from reading a lot about Wright, Melinda also, we've been Wright fans for long enough that we've been to many of the Wright buildings uh, around North America. We have been to many of their landscapes and we visit them repeatedly learning. And um, I know that this, this house in particular, because it probably has the most intact of all the landscape surrounds of all the context of Wright's work. It's the one that continues to be for us, the most powerful. Again, you look at the road that's going up to, the, to what is now the offices off of the guest house, but this is um, old trails on that landscape. Look at it, same, basic same view, different season, a few years different, different light. This is very late in the day, this is almost five o'clock, and you can see the sun is just going through the woods, but take you back. Uh, now, I don't have a tripod set up. These are almost all these images are taken handheld, except for some night shots I'll show you. But one of the things that I've used as a technique to learn any kind of landscape is to set up framings for myself. And it's easier to have the camera remind you of what that framing was. Sometimes I'll drag them along on a folder on an iPhone. Other times I'll look at them before I get out of the landscape. But that's how I can go through and say, all right, I've got that image and I'm gonna take that again because I loved it before and look at how different it is now. The uh, a landscape and, and an architectural uh, place like Falling Water is so complex, so nuanced, there's so many intimacies. It's something that literally every time I'm there, it's new and it's different. And I don't know that there's better uh, there's just always enlargement. There's always expansion. 
This is a witch hazel. Uh, on the left, it's that's uh, young tulip poplars on the right. But again, this in this kind of all these lines, look at the way the line of the witch hazel on the left, which is characteristically they shaped, it's always got these angled branches. And then look at the steps going down from the house. Um, I don't think that Wright set up this particular uh, juxtaposition, but he knew that these were things that would be possible and even likely, depending upon how astute the viewer is. Again, not just framing, but this house has transparency. And I think really great architecture has this revelatory quality that allows you to see it and see through it. Now, I'm not gonna tease you with a lot of interior shots today, but this is something that's really instructive about the way this house works as a machine to see the landscape. So these are hope windows. They are still made. They're, they're very beautiful handcrafted windows that are metal, they have metal hinges, they're bimetal. And uh, so on that second floor, these are the windows and they, they open up double. They, have, they, have a, they meet in center and then they have a clasp and then they have hinges at the outside. So there they are from the outside. And if I show you a sequence from the inside, this is part of the way I understand this house and have come to understand it even more over the years. This is just a view looking kind of at, I'm standing height, I'm looking straight out, uh, the windows are open and you can see into the landscape. So the house is giving you perspective. Now you could stick your, you can't fit out that window and fall, but you could stick your head partly out that window. And as much as this is interesting, I actually have come to see that it's the framing from a little bit of a distance that is actually the most dramatic. It's the most different from simply standing out in the landscape yourself. Because as interesting as this is, you lose a lot of your points of reference. At the same time, knowing that the framing is there and allowing it to be something that says, look and look again and look again and keep seeing deeper each time you do. I've come over the years to be fixed on these two rocks that are down in the run below the house, in Bear Run. They, they weren't put there by anybody with assignable gender or, or, or name that's you know, used the same around the world. They just, they happen, but they are remarkable bits of sculpture. So there they are with an early view. Here they are in a different season. Again, framed by those magical windows. If I use a long lens through the windows and get down on, you can see a lot of detail. And you, you can actually do a lot of this with a modern iPhone or, or a new Android, but this is actually taken with a good camera. So I'm just closing in from there, standing in the same spot, looking at those rocks. And again, in fall, in this case, they are in shadow. But if I close in again, I'm gonna pull more light on those rocks looking closely. So if I ask you a question, I, I know you can't answer me, but you can answer it to yourself. If I say to you, all right, I've shown you a number of images. If you look, let me go back. And if I say, okay, look at those rocks, and you're kind of getting to know them now and you're getting their surrounds. And you've, you've, you've kind of become somewhat intimate with that scene. So if I say, okay, at least right now, we've got a snowy landscape and the, the landscape at, at uh, uh, Falling Water has probably got a bit of snow on it. And uh, so if I say to you, what do you think they look like today? And don't cheat by looking at the Falling Water webcam. Uh, let's cover them in snow. Can you imagine what they look like? Could you paint it? Can you just use your imagination to put a layer of snow on there? That's what they look like. This is a time when I was working with uh, Linda on the 75th anniversary book of Falling Water and uh, we wanted to get some snow shots. I did the chapter on landscape. And so we talked and she said, oh my gosh, we've got you know, three feet of snow on the ground and we're getting more. So I bought some deep waders and got in the car and drove out there. And this was one of those shots I got that day, just one of those moments. And uh, it was worth it. Again, just for in the interior, another point is that the house inside and out, it's colors that you would see in the landscape, especially if you're looking. So there's Wright's Cherokee red, but during the making of that house, this stone was unearthed and it was incorporated in the house. It's part of these subtle things that attune you to what you're gonna be experiencing. 
I have over the time come to know things that will repeat. They will repeat in certain seasons. They're not there all year round. But this is one of my favorite views, if you will. It's, it's from the, the bridge that you cross over if you're walking toward the house. Uh, so you're going over Bear Run at the point, but you turn left and you look at the house and you see this reflection below the terrace. And it, it changes different times of years, the colors and it change, but it's always there. It's something to look forward to. How does it, how does it morph with the seasons? Right was making someplace that exposed you to landscape in as many ways as possible, made it a part of the journey and he provided different kind of access. So even though he put the house over the falls and I'm sure that he did that partly because he wanted to make sure that it was one picture that you would be viewing. You do see the falls, but not so much right when you're in the house as when you're out and around the house. If you wanna get access to that way Bear Run is flowing through there, you can go down these steps and you come out and there's this wonderful Lipschitz uh, sculptor out there and look at the detail on that. Now, I know that Ann Tallerich might've had a little bit to do with some of these things, but what Ann is so good at is noticing when things regenerate. These are all plants that are native to Western Pennsylvania and they found a little niche in the corner of that house. So Ann gently conserves, enhances, augments these things, but it's so light. The, 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 the gentle touch is so important to making it just seem like there is nobody except all of these forces, all of this multiplicity of things and living processes that are making these pictures for us to be immersed in and enjoy. That's an image taken. Uh, it's not actually a still image, it's a movie. And using Keynote, I can put in a movie up and the first frame will be pretty sharp. And then I can make it start moving and you can see these little bits of magic that happen if you're tuned to it. And I love this stuff. It's just, you know, it doesn't happen all times a day. Even that day, if I'd been there a different time of day, I wouldn't have seen this. That was a movie taken with a, a big um, full frame camera that I'm trying to hold still. Nowadays, everything is so uh, image stabilized that you wouldn't see any movement at all in that. I know that Wright was a movie fan because he made these screens all over the house. Those parapet walls on those great cantilevered terraces are the best movies in Western Pennsylvania. It's not an accident. They are capturing shadows. They are capturing, capturing projections. They change through the seasons. This is obviously is fall. But I've loved watching these as different plants put their particular patterns on top of Wright's architecture. So this is that synchronicity between architecture and landscape, a landscape that is architectural, a building that is so much about living process. If I do this to show you a bit of a movie, it just really comes alive. I was taking this little clip one day and uh, a woman, I don't know, have no idea who she was or what her name was. She was friendly. She came up to me. She said, what are you taking a picture of? And I said, well, actually, I'm, I'm looking at the, the dancing patterns of these plants in this forest reflected or silhouetted on parts of the building. And so she stopped and she looked and she said, uh-huh. And then I saw her walk down towards this part of the house and she saw somebody coming up. She caught their eye and started a conversation with them. And I couldn't hear them at this point, but I saw her pointing up and saying, look at this, look at this moving. That's the way we can share these moments. And that's the kind of uh, landscape this is. There's so much there to look at. There's so many things that are really very specific, very intimate. And if you've got an eye for it, it's a great place to just say, take a look. I love the integration of all of this wildness. I um, worked a number of years ago with Timber Press to put William Robinson's book, The Wild Garden back into print and kind of updated with a modern ecological understanding. And uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a good example of where, it's not that there's no tending here. They do weed things. If they get some pest that's in there, they'll, they'll pull something out of there mechanically. But for the most part, this is very gentle stewardship of a living landscape that has got a lot of autonomy, a lot of unscripted 
you know, synergistic behavior, kind of looking up towards the, the guest house. I love this. You can, it's easy to take this image if you're at the house and you walk up the slope, up, let's say towards, uh, if you're heading up towards the, the, uh, uh, the offices or towards the uh, Paradise Overlook. It's right, kind of making a statement, I think. He's not here to talk about it, but it's this wonderful ashlar, this stone that he is, is part of the house. It meets up with this outcrop. And there is this line, and it's, it's, it's making a point of the difference between contrivance, beautiful contrivance, that stonework of the house on the left, and basically what's pre-existing. But both of them so mutually respectful, and it gets you thinking about how much that life is allowed to have its own space and movement and process. And I know from looking at this over decades, there's always this kind of life there, it's always different, season to season, uh, day to day, hour to hour. If you just use light as an organizing feature, that alone is enough to just say, I'm gonna make a trip to falling water and all I'm gonna do is look at light and shadow and silhouette and projection. And you will find that the marriage of the landscape and the house are what work together to do this. Neither one of them separately is as strong as the combination. The, you know, the question always was, you know, how come Wright put the house on top of the falls? And I do think it was a brilliant move. It, it uh, instead of just having the house on some distant hill, looking at it like it's some kind of a flat screen TV, it's something you experience. And the house is this magnet for your eye. It's a destination visually and experientially. And it gets you looking at the falls and then it, it reveals so much about the falls because of the way it orients you. I've known over the years that in any season, there's moss on that falls growing beneath the water. And sometimes like in spring, it's very easy to see it. This is a, 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 an early um, season day where the water is flowing, flow is not too strong, the moss is quite evident. And Here's another totally different season. So you say, oh my goodness, there's a lot of water flowing. It's winter time. Is there really moss underneath there? Absolutely. And what I know from over the years is that the moss is always there, but because of all this dynamic, because of all the power of this landscape, it changes its patterning with each season, just as the patterns of the frozen sculpture of ice and that falls change. Sometimes a reframing is lucky. When I was putting this presentation together uh, this week, I was looking through images over literally decades and, and thousands of photographs. And I found that this is a scene I've always loved. This is just bare run, just above the house. So if you're looking kind of at the houses, be looking and you're on that bridge, you're looking to the right, if you know the landscape. And there are two images in very different seasons, but you can see the similarities and the very different uh, things that are apparent or are obscured in different seasons. This is the hangover. Justin was telling me this morning that this was a, uh, a building that the, the Kaufmans built uh, early on when they first had the property. This is just the remaining foundation of it. It's right along um, 381 Mill Run Road. Uh, it eventually was uh, mostly dismantled because the road became paved, become, became noisy, and they really they were then beginning to uh, envision falling water and other places that they wouldn't need a house right on the road. But if you're looking closely, if you're coming, especially if you're coming from the north and you're coming down towards falling water on your right, you'll see this foundation in the woods. Winter is a great time for revealing all that uh, snow can do to enhance and accentuate the lines of anything, whether it's trees or buildings. I love what it does to kind of make clear that this house is, uh, and Linda's pointed this house, it's a great refuge. You know, if you're in the, if you're in that building in the coldest weather, uh, the snowiest, the wettest weather, uh, the house is really a great place that you can take shelter in. At the same time, if you dare to go out on those terraces, or to look at these things, you'll find all kinds of things to see. And you can come back in for some cocoa or maybe a bit of bourbon or whatever is your preference. But I love the way 
the textures of the house and a house like much of Wright's best work is very, very heavily textured. I love what the snow does for the texture and the form of the house and the hemlocks. These are these walls with the projecting bits of flatter stone uh, up uh, near the guest house, uh, totally transformed. And you could, you could take photographs all day long of different patterns of the snow on these little ledge-like protrusions. This is probably my favorite time of year to, to view the guest house stairs from the main house up. It's just spectacular. As again, you got a whole bunch of little movie screens there that are catching all of this uh, drama of the forest being silhouetted on top of Wright's architecture. That passage from the, the uh, visitor center down to the house is marvelous in winter. There are good treads there. You need to watch it if it's all icy, but it's, it's a pretty nice journey. And one of the things that I've, I've really enjoyed doing over the years, this is again, walking down to the house. I've come to know this landscape intimately enough that there are little, little bits of it. There's sometimes it can be private. Any, anybody can do this. You can do this for yourself. You find something you love and you like, and you say, I'm gonna revisit that. And so there was never a sign that said, as you go down about you know, 300 yards on the left, you'll find a sweet birch. This is the birch they used to make root beer out of, sometimes still do. And it's, it's draping itself over some rocks there. And if you look at that, you'll see this curious habitat of the polypody fern. And um, so I just make a point to look at that over the seasons and I like to revisit it. And, I, and it, it's a comfort to me to say, you know, this is now going on the fourth decade and I've been visiting that tree and those roots on the way down to the house, just a little incidental moment that says, I know this place. The house is marvelous when it's lit inside and the landscape is growing dim. Uh, these are shots taken with an older Sony RX-1 um, and um, it's a, um, it was one of the earlier uh, APS-C uh, format uh, digital cameras, but it uh, had a pretty good size sensor and really good resolution. Uh, not a lot of tricks to it, but if you put it on a tripod, you could capture the house at night like this. And it just so almost preposterous when you see it hanging out into the darkness, you can barely see the stairs below it. But what a warm, welcoming environs. Again, layered even at night, embedded in the forest even at night. Just a, a, a great building in all times of day and all seasons. Again, this idea of getting your favorite points in the landscape and deliberately making them destinations. I know this red bud uh, that was planted, it's up above the, uh, the main house, up towards the guest house. And, uh, and Talarek and I have been up there talking about this tree and watching it over the seasons. And so it's a kick to kind of frame it so that you can say, all right, there it is. It's already bloomed. It's now in fall color. But what does it look like when it's blooming? Oh, it looks like that. And there's a lot making up the composition of this image. There's that wonderful uh, urn on top of the house. Here's a close-up that was used as the, uh, the image mentioning this webinar on the Falling Water site, but this is that, that wonderful eye that the um, leadership and the uh, people that have, uh, Justin, Ann, uh, Linda, so many have brought to this place. It's a, it's a great nuanced, subtle imagination that sees the beauty in this and presents it so gently for anybody that cares to look. This is Ann, I'm standing next to her and we're out there you know, it's cold. It's, it's, you know, it's we're kind of into winter now. And so you'd say, all right, well, why would you bother to go see that, that red bud at this time of the year? But we're out there talking about it, talking about what she's done to keep that tree alive. And then you look at the light, that moment of light with a hemlock and rotted entrance in the same urn. And who needs the flowers or who needs the fall color? It's just a beautiful moment. This is the pool above the house, similar lighting. This is actually just an iPhone shot. But it, uh, the landscape, it feathers out in so many different areas. Th this is just an example of one of the many trails that we like to hike and hike and hike again. You know, there's 5,000 acres in Bear Run, so 
you could you could hike for a long time and you'll never wear it out. You will always find new things. So here is Melinda and I hiking in Bear Run. We're finding a rock that's kind of interesting because there's the false Solomon seal growing in just you know an inch or so of organic matter on top of that rock. Even in spring, we are perfectly happy to look at something beautiful like this looks like some kind of a you know Japanese paper construction but they're just beech leaves from last season still hanging on before this buds this year's buds have opened there in the fall is the preposterous but yes those are blue and purple and pink colors of the maple leaf viburnum and there they are out there mixed in the bear run preserved landscape surrounds the house with that great rotor engine maximum the uh, ironclad rotor engines this is maybe my favorite violet. It's Viola Hastata, the halberd leaf violet. I like it's yellow, but there are a lot of yellow violets. What's fun about this, if you again, you get to know these things and revisit them, is to see it when it's in leaf later in season. It's now setting seed, but you can see those leaves have almost looks like a variegation. It's just a kind of a, a, a whitishness in the pattern and the venation on the leaves. Quite a beautiful plant. Viola Hastata, the halberd leaf violet. Uh, don't eat this if you see it. This is Actea rubra. It's, um, it's another uh, woodland denizen that you see in that richly diverse woods that surrounds falling water. The whole of Western Pennsylvania is trillium country. This is on a rainy day. I just couldn't resist because that's about as dense as you ever see trillium growing. And here they are in the ex expanse of Bear Run. This is the, the uh, trillium grandiflorum, the large white trillium, a very beautiful plant. Actually really, fairly common, it's not a rarity, but it's none, nonetheless, it's a delight to come on it. It often mixes within you know, Bear Run in the falling water landscape with the red trillium erectum. So here are the two of them just growing together and there's a close-up of erectum. That foliage on the right, I could test you if we were live and in person, but that foliage on the right, if you really know it, is Colophyllum thalactroides, it's the blue cohosh. It's, Nothing has leaves like that, even when they're unfolding. And these are the intimacies that you get if you really come to know a flora, an ecology, a forest. Uh, the ferns alone, it would be worth, if you want to study ferns, falling water would be a great destination because the fern flora is amazingly diverse. And there are some fabulous expressions. Just this happens to be the maidenhair fern, Aeantum pedatum. There's something in every season there, even times you wouldn't think about. This is July, this is middle July. And that's when that red engine maximum blooms. So if you take that walk down, you'll see the, the woods below you, which before just looked like a bunch of evergreens. And here it is in bloom with these big flowers with their little greenish patches on the upper petals. We explore beyond uh, the falling waters uh, immediate landscape. Uh, we go into Ohio Pile. There are a number of different uh, runs there. Uh, there are a number of different park spaces. Uh, this is just one of these uh, uh, bits of water that that day that we were out there, we we're looking at these rocks in the stream. And then we saw this and I took this movie. And I'm gonna ask you, what are you looking at? I'll let it run. Just taking this with a little camera. Now, the clue to it is, and there's, I'm showing this, there's a rock up in the stream. The rock is up there, and at the moment I'm taking this photograph, it's sunny. But the moment I'm taking this movie, uh, it's actually not sunny. It's just bright enough that there is a projection of the surface of the water on the rock. And then at the last minute, the light changes and the surface of the rock is revealed. I don't know how useful that stuff is, but it sure is beautiful. It sure is fun. And if you're still a child or a child at heart, these are the things that just are delights, just little momentary revelations in the middle of the day. We've been out there over the years with all manner of friends and colleagues, uh, inviting people who haven't seen it, people from different parts of the world, uh, people from Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, this is out there with our friend Pete from Holland. Uh, we, uh, we spent a few days staying on the property, 
hiking all over the place. And Pete found all kinds of inspiration for the work that he does internationally, looking at these landscapes, learning new plants, but learning new combinations. In this case, we had gone out to uh, Cucumber Falls and walked down to the edge of the Yakagani from there. And one of the things that I've, I've known is absolutely as reliable as a day is long is that along the edges of that, you will see the fragrant um, rhododendron arborescence. That's that rhododendron there. There, it's a fragrant native azalea. And in fall, there it is with uh, royal fern. This is Osmunda regalis, which turns to spectacular uh, patterns and colors in fall. I wish one of you could you know, maybe you can email me and tell me what the name of this creature is. I love finding stuff like this. It, you know, what you're looking at is a hemlock. The hemlock rooted in on the right, and then it grew out over the top of this rock. And then this thing, which is double, it's got two torsos, it walked over and sat down on the hemlock. I, I, I was tempted to start a conversation with it, but I was kind of was in awe and fearful and wanting to be respectful. So I just looked at it and I took a picture and I moved on, but what a creature. Cucumber Falls is again, just a few miles from uh, falling water uh, on the far side of Ferncliff Peninsula. There's a beautiful old run to it. And this is over the top of the falls. And this is what it looks like if you get down into it. Here's a brief movie. Uh, this particular fall, uh, this last fall in 2020, when I took this uh, little clip with my iPhone, uh, there was not that much flow. Uh, sometimes the falls is very dramatic, but you can walk down and walk underneath it, and then you can follow it down again to the edge of the river. One of the hikes that I've made probably more than any hike, and I've never been to Falling Water and not made this hike, is I've walked up to Paradise Overlook. Uh, this is uh, well, enough, well marked. It's, it's on the Falling Water property. It's, you know, I don't know, it's a, maybe a 10 minute walk from the house. Uh, or if you're looking or taking pictures like I do, you can take an hour, but you can do it in 10 minutes. It is a high perspective out on turns in the Yakagani River. You're looking down on the river. In this case, late day, great light. Another day, another season, uh, broad light showing you the turns in that, that river. This is, of course, an area is very famous for it's white water and for kayaking and all kinds of canoeing and other safe activities. You gotta watch it, you don't wanna go over that falls. But at the top of the overlook, I've come to love all these sweet birches and nisses, the black gum or pepperidge tree, like on the, on the package of Pepperidge Farm cookies, Nissa sylvatica in fall. I look at Nissa on the ground because it's the leaves are something that uh, one that I've always loved, you can kind of gather them up or make patterns with them, look at the differences between those and see things of maples or tulip poplars. The view at the top there is emblematic of something that I've known for a long time, and that is that Falling Waters landscape is a lot more diverse than mine is. Even though it is the Eastern deciduous forest, there's just a whole lot more intact diversity within these forests that make up Bear Run Preserve than there is in my eastern uh, Pennsylvania uh, woodlands in the, what we call the mid-Atlantic, which has had a whole lot higher human density over the years, a whole lot more disturbance, a whole lot more introduced species. And so for me and Melinda, going back to falling water in some ways is like traveling back in time into a greater diversity. There are again, different views, different seasons on uh, the uh, view from Paradise Overlook. There are tons of oaks regenerating everywhere in the woods at Falling Water, and this is a very healthy sign. There are reasons for it, as I'll explain in a moment. There's that oak, and there it is in leaf. Uh, this is just walking down uh, Bear Run. Uh, it's a great walk. Uh, so I'm walking at this time now. It'll take you down to the railroad tracks below uh, Paradise Overlook, but I do this to, to kind of understand the different elevations, understand how these things relate, and to, again, appreciate all of the shadow player patterns. And these are things that I incorporate in design for clients and, and, and the private and public landscapes, part of the value. And I've in many times used photographs taken at Falling Water and in Bear Run Preserve and Ferncliff Peninsula to say, these are 
just unscripted occurrences, but with the, the, the resolving that a camera does with the, the, the craft work of framing images, you can produce things that you can say, yeah, I wanna replicate that. Nobody that I know of built this pool. It's just part of Bear Run, but it sure is pretty in fall. So here I am below Ferncliff Peninsula and I'm down along the railroad tracks, technically not supposed to be there. I could get run over by a train. I'm very careful not to. That is a foundation at the edge of the tracks. And it is a foundation that was once this. This is the original Bear Run station that served a community of people a long time ago that lived there and then people that came in because this area became uh, very popular for tourism even more than a century ago. So at one time it justified this was these Western Maryland tracks. They, they hauled freight, but they also had passengers that were alighting at this station below Ferncliff Peninsula. Well, there's Melinda and our friend Paul Van Meter at the time uh, looking, we were walking with Anne and, and uh, we were looking at the foundation. That's all that's left of that station. There it is. There's the station, that's all that's left of it. Well, if you then climb up the slope, and it helps now with a modern iPhone because you can get an orientation with uh, Google Maps set on satellite so you don't kind of get lost in the preserve, but you can walk up, and I did, I did this again this fall, you can walk up from the tracks and you can walk up through the woods. And part of what is a revelation is that if you're looking at these woods, you will see diversity that's not that common anymore. This is too bad, but it is common because of the efforts of the Kauffman's and the continuing efforts of the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. This kind of diversity still exists because the disturbance that was there at the time, if you go back to this image of this, look at the woods. I, I failed to point this out, but look at the woods up there. It was heavily logged before the time that the Kauffman's got the property in the middle 1930s. They stopped that logging activity and so the regeneration that we are now benefiting from now, the regeneration happened beginning in the 1930s before so many of the introduced weeds that were introduced deliberately or inadvertently by human activity, they just weren't there. So the forest regenerated to what it was before. And it very much represents a forest that looks more like 1935 than like 1975, 1985, 1995, 2005, or the year that will be coming up next. This is just the pink lady slipper. It's there in profusion. I prefer it top down, but a beautiful thing that moves around. These populations move around, but they're always there, always a spring part of the woods. If you're looking at some of the really important stuff, that's a seedling of witch hazel. These are oak, these are young oaks, but they're already old enough to be putting out acorns. These are viable populations, white oaks, seeding like crazy. I mean, I've, I've actually looked at this before. You can, there are many places along these trails, even back and forth to Ferncliff Peninsula or, or back and forth to Paradise Overlook, where if I mark out 20 feet and I count the oak seedlings, I'll find 20 or 30 oak seedlings in 20 feet. Whereas in many of the woods, in this part of Pennsylvania, you can walk in a white oak woods and you can walk 50 feet and not find one seedling. And a lot of that is just deer browse. The amount of deer that are in the Eastern part of the state are such that they are just browsing this out. So part of it is lower human population density, uh, less concentration of deer in this part of Pennsylvania. All oaks regenerating by the dozens on that property. Edgar Kaufman uh, and his wife and family were truly uh, philanthropic. They did so much to, they gave the house to the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. They also played a significant role. A grant from uh, Edgar Kaufman in 1951 was really what made it possible to secure Ferncliff Peninsula. Now this is a new bridge built on the old piers of the Western Maryland Railroad heading over from Ohio Pile to Ferncliff. Uh, it's something that we do whenever we have time if we're at a falling water, we always make this trip and we always hike it, walk it. You can swim it, you can be out there looking at this great river. And uh, it is a marvel of diversity. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, you, you might know um, 
uh, it's uh, nine bark, uh, physosthesia, uh, in bloom, in fruit. This is that fragrant um, azalea with an alder, that's all the cellulator on the left, and this azalea in the rocks right along the edge of the Yakagani River. There's that azalea, it's a June bloomer. It's a, it's a great garden plant if you like to garden, uh, but here it is in its habitat and it's bloom, it, it blooms so profusely along the edges of the Yakagani that if you're there in mid-June, the entire area is sweetly perfumed. It's just gorgeous. This particular azalea has a very glossy leaf on it. It's quite nice. There it is and the flowers are distinctive and they have these long red styles and stamens, Rodentian arborescence. Here on the rocks, uh, not too far from these alders and red engines and joe pie weeds and ferns is trout viteria. This is a plant that is not very common, but it is a Pennsylvania native and it grows all along the rocks, along, along the edge of this. Uh, it's an edge plant, but it likes it moist. The Turk's cap lily grows along that. These are all shots just taken along the edge of Ferncliff Peninsula, right as it is uh, following the uh, Yakagani. There's Melinda out there with her University of Delaware Botanic Gardens t-shirt on. She has a small camera, but a good lens and she's got a good eye and she is following an ebony jewel wing damselfly. And this is the result of that work. Again, we are, we are plant people first, but we have ecology backgrounds. We're very interested in this stuff. And of course we've been close with Doug and Cindy Tallamy for years and they're forever uh, getting us to look deeper at the insect world and the, and the greater animal world. But this is a ebony jewel winged damselfly captured with a small camera along the edge of that river. Here is Cephalanthus, button bush, growing again with this. This is the silver spotted skipper. These things are, you, you can't miss these things if you're out there. It's a wonderful walk, again, conserved. There was early uh, some conservation core work done to make some steps to make this more accessible. That is a uh, spice bush swallowtail on one of the Joe Pie weeds. There is uh, a bit of interpretation here, which is helpful because you might not know if somebody didn't point this out, that Ferncliff is on the National Historic Register and conserved partly because it's a great fossil site. And so this is prehistoric Pennsylvania. And if you're looking at these rocks and you're thinking, what the heck is that? Is that concrete that somebody left a bit of burlap over? No, these are patterns of tree ferns in the rocks. You can't miss them. Just it helps to know what they are. Uh, I have not learned all my tree fern genera, but uh, there are quite a few of these wonderful tree ferns in the rocks as you're taking the trails around there. Now, there are a lot of plants out there that are, that are just now kind of coming at the horticulture. This is Coreopsis tripteris, which is now getting some kind of a presence because there's a gold standard, a new cultivar that's kind of a shorter form of it. But this is a plant you can see from Melinda's height. This is a plant that grows close to 10 feet tall. There it is underneath that bridge from Ohio Pile over to the uh, uh, peninsula itself. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful garden plant. And sometimes if you've got a landscape and you want to do meadow work or whatever, and you've got a little bit of moisture, uh, Coreopsis tripteris is a great uh, tick seed. We follow these things through the seasons. So I'll actually go back and find the same plants or the same population and say, are they a viable population? Are they setting seed? Uh, there's Nissus and, and um, uh, rock oaks, Quercus uh, montana or uh, chestnut oak, it's also called. We uh, very often bring our bicycles out and get on that rail trail now. Uh, there's Melinda leaning over the bridge, uh, which is, was, was a railroad. It's now a single track and it's a fabulous journey with heucheras that are modeled. There is interpretation along there. You know, coal is a big part of the story of Western Pennsylvania in particular. And these are coal seams that are interpreted. And uh, so, Whenever we do this kind of stuff, I mean, we, we've ridden 15, 20 miles in both directions from Ohio Pile. This is all regenerative uh, forest, if you will, when the railroad was, was uh, taken out, became a rail trail, all these trees, mostly tulip poplars in this view right along the tracks just come in, took advantage of it. You see rough grouse along there. We saw this a couple of years ago. 
Um, we, we look at whatever catches our eye. There's a lot of limestone out there. There's sandstone out there. Uh, this particular scene, we were looking at all the different maidenhair ferns and things over these rocks and the water coming down. And we, we had our own little rainbow for just about a half an hour. There's the bridge taking you back to Ohio Pile. There's that cabin this fall. I uh, did make a trip that proved to be more than worthwhile. But this is just an iPhone photograph. Uh, if I set the phone wide, you can see the bigger view of it. Blue skies, clouds coming in or going out with a red maple on the left. And all of that in the foreground uh, or below uh, is just a combination I thought was beautiful. It's almost black. It's such a dark brown. It's almost a black. And this is the kind of scene that I would happily invite into any kind of a design landscape. This is almost entirely Vernonia. It's New York ironweed. And it's, it's been damp. The day that I got there this fall, it had been raining very heavily. So these things are still darkened from the rain. But that's the kind of regenerative growth that is part, it's, they're emblematic. They're, they're signatures of Western Pennsylvania and they're things to be celebrated. I went out to, um, we had to stay and work with the university uh, this particular week. So I was, I was out there by myself and uh, I was looking uh, on the ground on Ferncliff Peninsula with the railroad overhead and looking at the forest, projecting its silhouettes onto those great structures. Again, following things that I've come to know like clockwork, if I am there in fall, and if it, this was late October, uh, I am going to be able to look at the edges of the Yakagani and I'm gonna see the royal fern, Osmunda regalis, at the peak of its fall color. Basically, every little opportunity there is between those rocks on the edge of that river. The parking lot, which was redone a number of years ago uh, when Linda was still director, has really, uh, with Anne's work, turned into a wonderful wild garden. And this is the parking lot of Falling Water as the main path through it, as it looked when I got there this fall. There's the house again, new moments, new trees, new combinations. These trees do move, and that takes work to make sure that they're working within the, frame, the framework of the house. Sometimes they need to replace a tree or start it along. Other times they're just nurturing things that recede. This is a shot that we couldn't have even done when we did that 75th anniversary book. This is a shot taken with that modern Sony that is, I'm actually taking it handheld and outside the house. So if you go there now, even if, if the, the house remains closed for a while longer with the virus, you get outside the house with a long lens and a camera like that and shoot through the glass on one side, through the living room, out the other side and see again what a marvelous, marvelous interior that is, what a marvelous connection that is with the landscape. Again, verticality, you know, two different pictures combined into one. The house, its safe environs above and the wild garden below. I am fond of witch hazels, they're one of our great uh, regional plants. They are, they, get, they reach uh, probably the, the greatest height of their expression in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, for us here, we might see one 15 feet tall. I've seen them well over 20 feet, sometimes 25 feet tall in Western Pennsylvania. And here they are on the side of the falls. And I'm just taking pictures just celebrating, looking at the house and all of its colors with the full blooming in late October of Hamamelis virginiana against the house. Again, a modern movie with a modern iPhone can do a pretty good job. This is just handheld, so they're rock steady. I've got a decent hand, but this is a camera holding it this steady. And all I'm doing is moving the camera very gradually to look at the layers. There's the falls, there's the rock. This is the conception of Wright working with the coffins and putting all these layers together into an experience that is part of everyday life if you were in that house, and if you're today in that landscape. Again, knowing that these mosses are going to be there, the patterns, if I look at them over the years, are similar, but always different. Each year brings new expressions new colors. This particular day, there was such a blue sky that the blue was reflected in the falls. It was reflected in the color off the glistening moss on those dark rocks. 
and that pool below the house, it's never been better, but it will be different and it will be just as good many other times. Those rocks that I've learned by looking out the windows in the second story of the house, I got down to look at them closely and to see things that I just never noticed before. You're just looking differently. We've had, or we, all of us have had more time to spend looking outdoors. Outdoors has been healthier. It's always healthier, but it's been particularly healthier this year. Now I found this, and this is the kind of surprise that's so much fun. I, I thought, wait a minute, what am I looking at? Justin put a, an oval window in the second story of falling water. Well, I don't think so. But sure enough, that looks like an oval window. And so I finally got close enough to see what it was. And I took a photograph with my uh, phone. This is a real camera shop. I took a photograph with the phone and Albert, who works at Falling Water and, and knows the house intimately, intimately, I showed it to him and he said, oh yeah, I know what that is. There's a glass top table on that parapet, on that terrace. And there's a vase on top of the table with flowers in it. And that is the sun catching the, the glass on top of the table and making a projection on the wall on the side of the house. And sure enough, it was gone in a half an hour. I, because this year was unusual, because the house was closed, but you could still come in as a, as a visitor and you could walk the landscape. One of the things that was the first experience for me is I was on the property and if I saw somebody other than somebody that worked there and they were in that landscape, they were not there to be inside the house. They were not there for a house tour. They were there for the landscape. So I, I took a walk as, as always the first day I got there late October, this fall, this past fall, I took a walk up to Paradise Overlook. And when I got there, I met another couple. We we're all, you know, socially distanced and properly masked. And we still had a conversation and they had come from a couple states away. And I said, well, you know, what brought you to Falling Water? And they said, well, we actually, we've never been here before. And I thought, what fun. And they, they came for the first time, even though the house wasn't open and they could look at the house in the landscape. I'm sure they will come back when the house is open again. But it was so much fun to be talking to people who saw this landscape for the first time. That was a shot that I took uh, when I first arrived at, um, uh, at, at uh, Falling Water this time. That's the view out over Paradise. Well, I was, I was talking to this couple. I showed them that view and I talked about the fact that it's something I, I'm in the habit of taking photographs of. But I said, by the way, when you were walking, if you're looking at the landscape, and they both were people that liked to garden. They weren't you know, dedicated gardeners, but they were, they were knowledgeable enough about things to, to have an eye. And I said, have you noticed this one tree that's got bigger leaves than anything else? It happens to be Magnolia Kimineta. And so I started showing them these trees. There's a, there's a leaf of Magnolia Kimineta on the ground, it's called a cucumber magnolia, and it's emblematic of that forest. And it's nowhere near as common in my part of Pennsylvania as it out there. So it's a big treat to see it. And I was able to have a conversation with them. We walked a little bit together so that they could spot that tree. They had kind of noticed it, but when you point it out, it suddenly becomes something that you've got it articulated. So in a moment with people that had never met each other before, we could share the knowledge of this tree and it's knowledge that they'll have for any visit in any season and any future time that they are in that landscape. Before I left, I took another photograph of that scene and I tried to frame it the same. This was in full sun. And I thought, okay, this is really beautiful. The, the Nissas and the, and the Scarlet Oaks are all brightly lit, but I compared it to the image that I'd taken the day that I got there when the image was of one of a, an overcast day where everything was wet. And I thought, you know, I don't think I wanna make a decision. It's not about better, it's just different. It's different insights. So I hope that's been a good start on it. I'd love to see any of you out there in the landscape. Melinda and I do get out there. We will get out there in all seasons. And I wanna leave you with the idea that even if that house is not open right now, hopefully sometime in, in this year, in any case, that landscape is worth a visit. That landscape with that house in it and that synchronicity and that, that graceful illusion between that wonderful artistry of Wright's architecture the stewardship of the Kaufmans and the Conservancy and that landscape, which is just full of surprise. So thanks so much.
Justin, I'm going to stop sharing now and right. uh, we can do questions or whatever you'd like. Sure. Rick, thank you. Thank you for that. I, I was watching the comments um, as you were giving your presentation, and I think all of us were truly uh, mesmerized by your images and could listen to you talk so poetically and show us uh, more of your perspectives for, for hours on end. So thank you for it's that. It's a poetic place. It's, it's, it's yeah, an inspiration. It's truly poetic, a multi-sensory journey that you provided us today, and you certainly opened my eyes in new ways of looking. Uh, and I think you have done that for for all of our participants too. Thanks. Um, it's always a pleasure. Do you, do you you know you mentioned a lot about you know looking more, being mm. more observant when you're out in the woods. So you know if you are going to take a walk in the woods, I know you always have your camera with you. But do you do you have yeah. any recommendations for people on what to take along, or just how to get in the right mindset for for a really enjoyable walk in the woods? Well, the first thing, and I think it's, it's actually been easier this year, is you have to give yourself permission to see. You have to think of yourself as an explorer. Uh, there is a book by a, a landscape architect who's on the Harvard faculty called, uh, it's called Outside Lies Magic. And it's, it's a favorite read. It's by John Stilgo, S-T-I-L-G-O-E. And the whole book sets you up as an explorer and gets you out there. Actually, he exhorts the reader, get out now get out beyond the trap of this digital world that is kind of basically um, imprisoning so many of us, get out there and explore. And uh, he talks about the magic that's outside and we never, never more than now have the time, we all have this time. So, so as much as we all use these devices, put them down, get away from the screen, get out there. Doesn't mean you can't bring your phone with you if that's your best camera. And very often the camera is the easiest camera for me. I mean, we actually, because we live in this preserve this year, we, we had so many people, especially with social media, the White Clay Creek Preserve in Delaware and Pennsylvania had so many people in it, even 9,000 acres, that a lot of our favorite trails got crowded. <laughs> and so we started taking deer trails and I started walking in the creek itself, sometimes doing two mile walks in the creek. And the iPhone was the perfect tool because a modern iPhone, if you you know, for a short while, get your pocket under the water, you're not going to kill a phone. You, you take a full frame Sony camera and you dunk it in the water and you might as well buy a new one. So we've got these devices now that they can be in your pocket. You're not even thinking about it. But if something comes up, whether it's something that needs a movie taken of it or a still shot, take it. You know, the damage is done. If you're talking about, about uh, you know, modern in, in, uh, equipment and the manufacturing costs and all that, the damage is done when you buy this thing. So by all means, use it, you know, mm -hmm. take pictures. And, uh, you know, with film, when you were taking a, every click meant 50 cents. Well, that was something else. You thought twice about it. But now, once you've got that tool, err on the side of taking the image. If you think even you think there's a possibility there's something there that's interesting, just take the shot. And if it turns out later that it's not interesting, throw it out. <laughs> I do find, and my brother has taught me this because he's been a photographer too, all these years and jerry years ago would sometimes just take pictures on the street or in a building or this or that and i would say jerry what are you taking a picture of and he was sometimes practicing photography so he needed to take a picture of something but he was also had this prescient mind to know that there would be things that he would capture that he couldn't anticipate the meaning of what was in that image at the time but now 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, what's in that image is absolutely revelatory. So, you know, surprise yourself. If there's anything in your, your head, you need to listen to your own voice. And just, mm -hmm. if something intrigues you, take a picture. And by all means, if, you, if you've got the luxury of having a child near you, and you can put an iPhone in that child's hands, you're not going to, you're not going to corrupt them. You're going to you put that phone in their hands and say, take a picture. Better yet, if they're if they're under eight, they're going to want to take a movie. They want they're done with still shots, but you know, use that youthful vision. I mean, there's a something that I learned about that it, that that kind of goes along with your question. There are studies, and you can look this up. There are studies that show that as humans age and mature, for for the reasons of efficiency, we learn the phrases we learn to filter out the familiar, and so we don't say. 
oh my goodness, look at that. It's incredible because we've seen it before. We can say, no, actually I'm driving right now. I should pay a little attention. But what you need to do is lift that veil. Like a child does not have those filters in place. So you need to lift that veil when you're out and you really want to see. And don't say automatically, ah, I can gloss over this. I've seen that before. And the, the way that I can continue to find things, to prize things out of a place like falling water is I have made it clear to myself, I know the truth of it is, there's more there to see than I've ever seen before. So I just have to have my mind open to it. We have the tools now. Mm -hmm. It's really opening your mind. So someone, someone just asked as you were talking, you, you, you said, put away the cell phone, just, just look and observe. Yeah. You're, you're often behind the camera. Do you find that being behind the camera separates you from the landscape or connects you? No, strongly and that comes from experience. I mean, I've really become very, the, com the camera is like a, I mean, I play keyboards. It's like an extension of a keyboard. You know, you, you can play music and you don't even know you've got your hands on the keys. You're, you're, what you're doing is feeling the music. And uh, I think if you take enough pictures, it no longer becomes an event that I'm taking a picture. You are just, you're seeing the landscape. Now, if I, you know, because I am working professionally and photography is very important to client work or design work or book publishing or this or that, if I'm being careful to make sure I've got a shot that has certain qualities or characters in it, that is going to make me more aware of the camera than if I'm just looking. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I think part of the, uh, the proof in the way I'm using it is that even though I have you know, on this desk right here, I'm not looking at $15,000 worth of camera equipment, but the iPhone, which is over here, I've taken more than 50% of my, cam my, my pictures in the last four years with the phone. And a lot of them I'm using professionally, mm -hmm. but I'm taking it because they are not, it's not an intrusion. It's not weighing my neck down. I'm not worrying about getting it wet. I'm not worrying about getting it dirty. I can wipe it off. You know, I can just have it with me and not be thinking about it. Uh, there are times when I will say to myself, I'm going to leave the phone in the car or I'm going to leave the camera in the car. But very often when I do that, I regret it because I'll see something and I think, you know, I want to remember this. And I have a really good memory, but not as good as these cameras or these phones. Yeah. Rick, a, a couple people have asked if you could repeat again some of the, the books that you per participated in writing um, with others or yourself. Um, and if you would like to give out your uh, web website address for people to visit your website. Yeah, you can find me very easily. If, if, if you just put in uh, Rick Dark, it's going to come up. It's just it's D-A-R-K-E. Um, I have a, a good friend who is a landscape architect I went to school with. His name is Gary Smith. And that's not a searchable name. So it's always, you know, the, the lucky thing is that, that R-I-C-K-D-A-R-K-E is a searchable string in a web environment. So you can find me easily. There is actually even a, 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 an email on there, although I'm not looking for a whole bunch of pen pals because I have a dog that wants to go for a walk and a wife that wants to walk with us. But uh, I'm fairly findable. Uh, I've... Um, I've been working on my own. I was at Longwood for 20 years. I left Longwood in 97 and it's been a long while on my own. Uh, and I do love the interaction of sharing these landscapes and insights with people. And that's, that's why, uh, like when I was at Longwood, you know, you'd be there and you'd go out doing, you know, I was curator of plants, the overall curator for Longwood. So I'd go out in, into the landscape as part of my work, but I love just gently, you know, not exactly eavesdropping or in, inserting myself, but hearing somebody say, that's a, a, a willow. And I, and I can gently say, no, actually, you know what? Those fuzzy buds are a magnolia. And you start a conversation and somebody tells you something like that couple that, that we, we started talking about the, the beauty of Paradise Overlook. And then I thought I'm going to ask them if they've noticed that there's one tree in the woods this last October that has leaves that are way bigger than anything else. They had noticed that but they had no way to put a name on it. And so we started a conversation. Yeah. And uh, that, that's, that's a great joy. Uh, I have I'm not really, I hope I never do another print book again. They, as wonderful as they are, they're so much work. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, but I am continuing to write and to publish. I am continuing to do a lot of teaching. Uh, and uh, 
I teach at the university where Melinda works. I, I work with my friend Sue Barton and we teach a course in plants and human culture, which is wonderful because even though it is something that is about like what we're looking at, it's, it's culture, it's landscape, uh, it fulfills a science requirement and a multicultural requirement for students. And so we get a lot of people who are not majors. I'm not speaking to the choir. So when Sue and I are teaching that course, we've got neuroscientists and, and uh, beverage management specialists and economists and marketing specialists and engineers and chemists. And to and we still have an honors group for the course. And, and even this fall, we took them out walking three and a half hours because in the honors group, we only had eight people. So we, that, that the university let us take eight people out in the landscape. And that was the, the revelation again, being on Falling Water site for the first time this year when it wasn't all about the house. Mm -hmm. as, as incredible as the house is, I almost think if it was a prerequisite, you should say, you have to come to Falling Water first and see the landscape. Then we'll let you come back and run the house because they each provide different things. It's too easy to go into a house that is so captivating like that and not have any time left for the landscape. So. Well, Rick, this has really been truly beautiful and enjoyable. And we thank you uh, for taking time out of your day to share your experiences with us. Well, thanks. Um, and I have to say from my perspective, how fortunate it is for me to know you and to, to help uh, you guide me in new ways of seeing falling water. So oh, thank you exchange. so much for and you, you and me and, and Linda, I think we'll all keep up. Uh, I was just talking with Linda just a few days ago about maybe doing a photographic project about the steps in Pittsburgh. And I love Pittsburgh. I work, I work with a landscape at the Cary Furnace. Uh, and uh, it's another one of these regenerative landscapes where we're making a lot out of a little. We are not being heavy handed. That's right. And that's the kind of work I love to do. So uh, I think Melinda and I will both have a number of reasons to be continuing to head west in Pennsylvania. Well, good. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you. Yeah. Thanks again. I'm going to, I'm going to stop my video and sign off, but this has been wonderful. Thanks again. All right. And I'll, I'll just close. All. Thank you, Rick. I'll just close out here real quick for everyone. So uh, if you enjoyed today, we of course have uh, recorded the presentation. Um, so you can find it in the virtual experiences section of fallingwater.org. Um, so visit it again, watch it again. I'm sure you'll see new things that you didn't see today. Um, and we are currently open for grounds passes. So if you'd like to see falling water during the winter, um, you can make a reservation for a winter walk and come walk the landscape and see it uh, in a season that many don't have a chance to see falling water. Um, our official tour season is gonna start up on March 6th. Um, we are gonna just start out again with doing exterior only guided experiences. But as Rick was saying, uh, that's a wonderful way to start your exploration of the site and understand the house's relationship uh, to its landscape. Um, we're still operating under reduced operations. So uh, we thank you for engaging with us online, but um, if you are able to uh, make a donation to us to support our ongoing operations and stewardship of the site, uh, you can visit fallingwater.org slash donate. Uh, we would greatly appreciate uh, any support that you can give. So. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, keep an eye out for next month's webinar. We'll continue doing these monthly uh, throughout the year um, on various special topics. So we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks so much.